Good morning. Thank you for inviting me and uh, probably continue Adrian's discussion. Uh, huge gap we were just talking about between any theory of what's happening and a practice. So how do we bridge that gap? I'm not going to try to completely answer that question because I don't think any of us know. Probably impossible to know right now. <coughs> And I may not follow all the slides, so what I propose to you is our biggest problem is not necessarily what's going on, at least among the people in this room. It's not what's happening to us, and it's not even technically some of the things we need to do. It's us. We're under the illusion that we're rational. And so, are we or are we not? Do we? In other words, what do we have to do to resolve problems by seriously questioning down to the gut level what some of our assumptions are? Now, the idea of compression and a book of that name are about five years old. Lots happened in that length of time. I may not follow all the slides, so I'd like to get into the discussion later. I'm going to go fairly fast with these. The idea of compression in the big squeeze. Can we do much better and use a lot less? A lot less means a lot less on the ground, a lot less energy, particularly fossil energy and so on. Uh, why? For some of you, this is a quickie review. Can't, you, you can't track all these problems. I can. I'm not sure anybody else can. I've found, even amongst in professional environmentalists, if you get outside their narrow area, I'll know more about what's going on than they do. And that has amazed me. But uh, you get this great big mix, I'll put them in a four ball area, but other people can do something similar. But these are risks when we look outward. What's the risk of what we're doing on the external world? This is different from the way most business people are going to look at it. When we say risk, what do we mean risk? To who? About what? Is there a risk of dying? Is, if I talk to a business guy, his risk is the risk that my cash flow is going to stumble a little bit. That's minor. But it will control the conversation. That's outside risk looking inward. Everybody's seen curves like this. Look at this bottom, uh, bottom 10,000 year blip. What we're seeing right now is a mighty small blip on a timeline that long. <clears throat> and we're all familiar with these curves, but are we just having a big party and what happens when the party's over? Here's one we don't usually see. Steel production in China went up about six times in 10 years. It now exceeds U.S. steel production by about six times. Ours has barely changed since the end of World War II. So, um, why would we need more steel? And what, is, what are the Chinese doing with all that stuff? Those that have been to China know that it is going into an awful lot of infrastructure of China. But they're on, a, they're on a curve that cannot be continued. This stuff isn't there to do it with. Something's going to blow up soon. So I call it a transition from expansion to compression. I'm not sure what I'm doing this. I think it's an <laughs> uh, a vigorous learning, and this is what I want to concentrate on. What do we call vigorous learning? And I'm, I'm open to talking about that for, uh, for quite a while. Because it's not what we think is going on, it's how do we approach it that's really going to count. What I call compression thinking has a lot of parts to it, but here are a couple that we'll start with. Uh, we're over-consuming now as a planet. Something's got to change, either by our voluntarily on our part, or something nature will change it for us. 
Another one that sneaks up on us is
if you're in the financial side of it, you still think you're competing. If you're in the engineering side, you know that you've got to collaborate a whole lot more with your, your colleagues and suppliers for design. And this clash occurs at many, many points. Wars are fought over much smaller gaps in thinking. Uh, let's talk about, forget the slides a minute. Talk about some basic assumptions. If we are successful and the world population levels out, that means age demographics in most countries are going to be pretty flat. You're going to have as many old folks, geezers my age, as you have kids in school. The assumptions we have for retirement plans, health plans, public or private, do not allow for that. What are we really going to do? Or are we going to revert, as good many countries, several countries are right now, they're afraid their population is going to drop, so they want to encourage the birth weight to rise to be sure they have enough workers. Next question, to do what? Next, if you're going to take care of a bunch of people my age, there's a lot of gray hair in the room, unfortunately, but if you're going to do that, what's the definition of work? We're talking really fundamental stuff. What is work? What is efficiency? Current economics, industrial economics, has overemphasized labor efficiency. If you went back over 100 years ago to ag economics, it was three or four factors of production. Land, labor, capital, and something they call management or innovation pretty standard. But you look at most economic texts of the last 50 years and what's the one that gets emphasized? Labor. To the detriment of a whole lot else. Something there has to change. And it's not that this is a new thing at all. Belief systems tend to fog us over. How do you change belief systems? This is akin to trying to change somebody's religion. And so there's no way to avoid the emotional part of it. I've tried to do that and pretend like rationality is going to do it. It does not. And those people that think they're rational typically have a lot of hidden assumptions that they're very emotional about. How do you get beyond our instincts and really work at trying to solve the problems. Listening to some people that we think are absolutely out of it, including some that have very little education. These are some key points of compression thinking. <coughs> Go down to number four. Heed the physical measurements before the monetary ones. Energy efficient or en the return on energy will tell you that. For example, the Canadian tar sands have a return on energy of roughly two to one. But if, if energy is scarce enough, you'll go for it because the money tells you you can make money at this. That logic is the same as animals tearing up every blade of grass in an effort to keep alive. The fallacy of the system has to come out. We like to learn by scientific methods. This is number five. But do we abide by all the facts or even try to find them? Uh, this is a complicated thing. This is uh, a little history of vigorous uh, learning as seen in some companies, and I'm about out of time, so I'm just going to talk about one or two elements of this. See the whole we have talked about. But if all we're doing in, in planning for a company is monetary, we're not seeing the whole. Common mission gets people on it. It will unify most people if we have a common mission. But do we? 
And uh, anybody been into Bill Isaacs? Isaacs is an MIT guy. Rules for dialogue. We don't have nearly enough of that. It's in most places the missing element in solving problems. Sorry, I'm skipping through this. So what I'd like to do is propose that, that an awful lot of the problems are assumptions, and an awful lot of them are us. And I appreciate technology too. I love all kinds of new stuff. But we've got to rethink. So thank you all very much. And I'm in room 805. I would love to talk with anybody who comes over. I always have questions. So. Um, one of the challenges, uh, Doc, is that uh, many of these impacts are going to. Uh, oh, first of all, before we, I want to. You made a statement. Uh, all the gray hair, better gray hair than no hair. I would say. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the challenges. Um, in many of the conversations that we've had is um, horizons. And uh, too many of the people that I've talked to recognize that they are going to outlive, they are not going to outlive uh, the time zone when the problem gets bad enough <coughs> to impact. And they will pass that problem on to, to future generations. Um, many of, of the people that I engage with, their horizon includes them. And if they're less selfish, them and maybe their grandkids. And for some of the more open mind people, maybe it's their grandkids' grandkids. Very few people really think much about that. What are the, your thoughts on how we get those um, time horizons changed so that people discount the future value less? than they do today. There are too many answers to that. One of them is, is to abandon, abandon time value money. When you, when you, now this is not something that a banker is gonna like at all. But, this, bro, yeah. This is not, uh, I'm not talking about the business side. Okay. I'm talking about public and uh, votes and what people think about and what they care about. How do we change their, not time value of money, but time, uh, their time value of observation and horizon? You change the reward system from something immediate to something else. So my favorite example is at least the tradition of a good many American Indian tribes. Your status did not depend on money. Status depended on what you knew about the tribe, how well you could exhibit your wisdom with your dance, the sort of response that you would give. And this is not something anybody wants to talk about. Your willingness when the time came to just go lay down and die so the rest of them can live. We don't usually think that way. So that's how deep this is. Don, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, Don Clark with Schneider Electric. Um, in um, Approximately 1775, 1776, Adam Smith wrote Wealth of Nations, which essentially defined what we now call the capitalist system. Not just free enterprise, but uh, economic growth of a nation through um, capital investment return and so on. That system has been in place for 200 and some odd years. It has some successes, it has some failures, of course. Um, environmental and, and many other uh, downsides. But when you look back in the great landscape of 250 years of history, 
I'd rather, met, rather live in today's economic climate than what we had 300 years ago. Uh, my point is, in the approximate 6,000 years of human history, the single economic system that seems to have economic success to bring the vast, the largest number of people up in terms of a standard of living, life expectancy, health, welfare, and so on, is capitalism. Now, what you are proposing, it seems to me, short of Fabian socialism, could only be implemented through coercive force. And history has also shown, either through Nazism, communism, or even Western European socialism, that the system doesn't seem to work when you run out of other people's money. So, short of coercive government edict to say thou shalt and thou shalt not, which is essentially Fabian socialism, what are you proposing? Certainly, the system of decision making that we have today would be threatened. And if you don't have enough stuff, you're either governed by a different system that humans have, or you're governed by nature's system, which is pretty cruel at times. And so, uh, corresponding with Adam Smith was that big rise in the use of energy. And so what we have seen, and we call democracy, we call the, you know, the capitalist system, the blah, blah, blah. Talk to you about this some more. But is that just an artifact or the human side of having the party with all that energy? That what we're really reverting to is hopefully something we learned during this era and can take with us in an era when we do not have that extra energy, the industrial revolution to ride on. And all this system came with it. So yeah, I would rather have lived in the last century or so than at any time in the prior history too, but it isn't the issue. I'd like to uh, just jump in here as well. And, and uh, it doesn't have, all have to be one way on this conversation. We have people in here who do have opinions and many of them don't have the hesitation to express them, Don. Uh, um, and, and the point is, uh, you raise the issue of you, what a wonderful thing that capitalism has been, uh, and how terrible it was beforehand, and the, how bad the alternatives were. And I don't think anybody in this room disagrees with you on any of those points. What you leave out in that statement is the context. And we're going to talk about context all the way through. The context of that was the, uh, and I use the, the Petri dish metaphor, where we are, we were, we just landed on the Petri dish, and we had all of this room and not much constraints. Um, the challenge is we are no longer just that little blob on, the, on a very big Petri dish, and the Petri dish is getting full. What happens to our existing systems when we run into uh, significant constraints? Now, many of us would like to see more Petri dishes, uh, and, and there's significant effort towards that. But barring that, um, I think the answer to your question is not doing things by force, but to change the way people think. And until we get people to think on longer horizons so that their self-interests uh, have longer term uh, uh, impacts, well, I think that we are gonna run straight into a uh, nature will fix this challenge. Yep. Jack? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Brian. <laughs> Brian said, Sion. Uh, to jump on that a little further, I don't think it's really capitalism is bad or the other is bad, same idea, but to look at the aberrant or the, uh, the aspects of things that don't work and say, how do you remedy that? How do you change those things so that the negative effects of capitalism or the negative effects of one thought process or another are, are mitigated, as opposed to saying, well, just go to communism or just go this way and say, all right, 
capitalism was working in an unconstrained model for a while. Something changed to cause some other problems. What changed? Or what did we not see in that model that we have to put adjustment mechanisms in so that things continue to progress without destroying the planet, destroying the economics, destroying society as a whole? Final question from the front. Jack, you go, Jack. I'd suggest a little bright spot in this. <laughs> uh, I think the key word is pathology. For years, we have ignored or actively avoided considering the pathology of any system that we're living in or creating. The most dramatic you're going to see in the next few years is the FAA's next gen system, which is a, a very interesting dream that's going to crash very heavily. The thing that we must do is think much more about what happens if it's not going to work. Doc's showing you charts that have how things have been, but we don't dialogue about the future of that chart. In fact, we're so nervous about it that we write and read science fiction instead of science prediction. Now, the bright spot is the baby boomers. For the first time in a long time, there are a whole bunch of people coming over the horizon that are concerned about their own personal pathology. How much longer are they going to live, and how can they have fun doing that? And when that rise of consciousness about the pathology of the system comes into being, we're going to have a hell of a lot more dialogue about what the future of Doc's charts look like. So it may be the gray hairs in the room that bring the news to the rest of the group. And I hope you live long enough that we can do it. Quickie rejoinder, I, I didn't get to it, but I'd call it the difference between a capitalism of competence and cowboy capitalism. If you've been around Texas, you know what I mean. <laughs>